um, a few years ago, um, I was um, I was attending the anti-BMP demonstration. It was shortly after the left list debacle. Everybody remember that? Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, the BMP had just got someone into uh, the um, uh, I don't know, it was in, into the city hall or whatever it was, uh, Greater London Assembly, and we decided to have a, an anti-BMP march through um, the centre of London. It was a very disappointing march. It wasn't very well attended. Um, and um, I sort of was um, stopped by David Osler. I don't know if you know him, he's quite a grumpy blogger and journalist and writes for the Red Pepper. And um, he said to me, you know, um, uh, this, this didn't look very big, and I said, yeah, it's disappointing. I was ho hoping about 10,000 would turn up, and he said, yeah, well, it's funny you should say that, because I was just saying to uh, my partner that that's probably what socialist worker would say attended. <laughs> <laughs> Get back home. Log on to socialist worker, 10,000. <laughs> Virus. So, um, you know, I mean, the first step that we need to develop, um, the first skill uh, we need before we go anywhere is that capacity which George Orwell characterized as a power of facing unpleasant facts. So don't lie to me. I know that everyone in this room has been at that uninspiring picket line, that drab demo, and you know, you've probably felt obliged to talk it up a bit afterwards to make it out uh, as if it was a raucous and joyous expression of class defiance as opposed to being uh, just a depressing waste of time. And um, <laughs> if you won't admit that, you will at least admit to having seen your protest reported in the Socialist Worker and said to yourself, fuck off. <laughs> so this, um, this tendency to talk up um, the prospects of a given moment comes from what seems to be a benign impulse and perhaps even a savvy one because uh, we recognise that the prospects before us depend uh, in part on people's subjective appraisal of the situation. If they're pessimistic, we wager um, they'll fall out of activism, they'll go and buy a lottery ticket or fuck it, a hundred because if you're going to be a sucker. Um, you may as well be a big sucker. So if you can keep their spirits up, remind them constantly of the resistance and struggle that's built into the system that never goes away, that keeps open the possibility of new radicalism, then they'll stick around and sell a paper or two. Uh, God help us if anyone actually sells a paper though, because um, it's a bit like the Jehovah Witnesses reaction when somebody actually opens the door and lets them in. <laughs> Fucking hell, really? No, I, I, I'm scared by this situation. Uh, so, um, where was it? Okay. Um, the problems with this approach are manifold. First of all, a little exaggeration or embellishment uh, has a tendency to slip into outright falsification. Uh, second, this easy, cheap rail politic, this casual relationship to the truth, tends to be replicated in other forms, in less palatable forms. Maybe one day you find out you're the one being spun a line uh, inevitably for your own good. Uh, parenthetically, um, during the faction fight, of course, you'll remember that um, uh, we often had recourse to the term tax. Um, and uh, it was understood that you didn't have to define the term, you knew it when you saw it, uh, spraying spit lather at you at point-blank range. Um, if you can imagine a tomato straining for expression, um, <laughs> as P.J. Woodhouse put it. No, um, it, it's, um, but I think actually a pretty close definition is someone who knowingly, cynically, cooperates in being systematically lied to for their own good. That's a hack. Um, third, the more you relentlessly accentuate the positive, the more you're obliged to construct dogmas to rationalize the falsehoods and to uh, lend them some theoretical coherence. So finally, resulting from that, of course, it just stops being convincing. You know, People stop listening. They may work with you, they may respect you. Personally, they, they don't necessarily consider your analysis reliable, in which case every advantage you thought you'd obtained from consistently putting a smiley face on it has been lost, and a great many other things have been lost beside. So, what does facing unpleasant facts mean today? I, I, I wanted to talk a bit about um, the um, uh, c question of rape apology and uh, rape denial in the context of the SWP crisis. Actually, Tony uh, covered everything I wanted to say earlier, but I do want to sort of link it in somewhat with the major theme, uh, which is that, um, you know, the, there's, the, some of the causes of the failure um, of the SWP's gender politics and I guess um, in our, uh, the failure of gender politics in other parts of the left too, um, is results from the same sort of sources of failure in other areas. Uh, dogma, sectarianism, a hierarchical culture, uh, all smothered in a sort of chipper can-do attitude, which um, can easily sort of um, result in failure in all sorts of ways. So for those of us who left the SWP a few months ago, um, we have hitherto completely lacked a conceptual schema by which to understand what's happened to us, to the left, and to the working class in the last 
30 or 40 years. I think Neil Davidson, who's still a member of the SNP, has been trying to remedy that, but we have to be doing the remedying as well. Um, there was a moment when the sages of what became the SWP in 1977 spotted a trend that others on the left uh, were denying, which was that the tide of solidarity uh, was receding and the right was gaining. And after what had been led, what had been an industry-led upturn, um, driven it seemed by the uh, rank and file movement, um, was uh, turning into a downturn. Manifestly, it now seems, the schema of a downturn was totally inadequate to capturing what would become the transformation of the class structure of the state, representative democracy, popular culture, and subjectivities by neoliberalism. Now, in our tradition, we've tended to treat neoliberalism as simply the spread of market forces and market values predicated on extreme atomic individualism, which actually concedes important terrain to the neoliberals. For example, the idea that there are such things as market forces, as opposed to various different types of markets embedded in diverse uh, cultural and political forms. The idea that the values of neoliberalism can be derived in a simple way from some eternal market. I mean, it simply doesn't work that way, and worse still is that our understanding of the downturn was always tempered by the tendency toward a catastrophist fundamentalism. No matter how bad things are for us, capitalism is always weak, it's always in crisis, it's always hurtling toward its final self-consuming crisis. And for that reason, we understood neither the originality nor the robustness of the neoliberal solution to the crisis of the 1970s. If you want to begin to understand what happens, you have to go back and read Stuart Hall, you have to read Police in the Crisis, The Great Moving Rights Show. Whatever you think of Hall's practical politics, he grasped the breadth of the transformative project being undertaken by the neoliberals, the fact that it was a comprehensive attempt at constructing a new hegemony which operated as much on the level of culture and ideology and the techniques of governmentality as on the level of industrial class struggles and privatizations and so on. And I, I, you know, I don't want to scandalize anybody, but you also have to read a bit outside the Marxist idiom. You have to read a bit of Foucault. You have to understand that he understood a few things about neoliberals because he was reading them back in the 70s when nobody else was. He noticed, for example, that it was not identical with neoclassical economic dogma, that it was not a recapitulation of classical 18th century liberalism, and nor was it the market society. He understood it as a comprehensive project for transforming society right down to the microphysics of selfhood. He wrote that neoliberals sought to install new techniques of self-government, that is, disciplinary means using incentive and punishment of getting people to accept the idea of themselves as entrepreneurial agents, enjoying the thrill of risk. We see this with the way in which welfare and the penal state is reorganized. Sarah Murdoch talked about this earlier on. I mean, it doesn't necessarily actually reduce the cost of expenditure, but it does t attempt to fundamentally change people's behavior. For example, if you have a small child, don't just stay home and look after her. Outsource the childcare to a minimum wage babysitter. Go out and bet on various opportunities on the market. Take a few jobs, buy some shares, reinvent yourself with new clothes and a new body. Take a flutter in a casino. The revival of gambling under neoliberalism isn't uh, coincidental, by the way. And if you're not very good at this, then we have bureaucratic punishments, the casual sadism of every life, the pleasure of mocking and humiliating the wretched. The rise of bear baiting shows such as Jeremy Kyle is not also not a coincidence. Now, people don't suddenly transform into Thatcherites. They have all sorts of complex ideas. There are uh, social democratic ideas that are resilient. So they don't wholeheartedly swallow the neoliberal dogmas, but it gradually, neoliberalism gradually formed part of the fabric of everyday experience. And the structure of incentives and punishments made you a mug not to adopt certain neoliberal behaviors, like turn your house into an asset or treat your body as a saleable commodity, or refit your personality according to the needs of the labor market. And that's increasingly the case now with uh, Facebook and the internet, where you have an online personality, and it has to feel bright, shiny, and sociable, and you have to have lots of friends. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so it shapes culture not just in the sense of representation, uh, you know, films, literature, popular science, and so on, but in the Raymond Williams sense of culture, of culture being ordinary, of the an anthropological sense, the way people live. So when you look at polls that say 70% of young people support benefit cuts, we know that it does, doesn't mean that they've sub subscribed to the whole sort of neoliberal doctrine. They have all sorts of complex ideas, and actually, after all, the exoteric doctrines of neoliberalism are too riddled with crudities and contradictions for anybody to take it wholly seriously. But we also know that they're profoundly affected by neoliberal governmentality and the conception of themselves and everyone around them as entrepreneurial agents, and thus 
the conception of the market as the almighty information processor and distributor of just rewards and punishments. And we should see this as part of an ongoing long-term project, okay? We could, um, if you think about the way student loans have been deployed and the way education, the education system has been financialized, this is designed to impose a new kind of disciplinarity. Even though you know, the higher education system will remain a state apparatus, it will continue to consume lots of uh, government money, it comes to be experienced not as a public good, but as a commodity that enhances your entrepreneurial self. And well, if you're, if you're enhancing your entrepreneurial self, wouldn't you pay for that? Isn't this something you'd be willing to be indebted for for the rest of your life, to be uh, enslaved for? And the more it is reinforced, the more it uh, undermines at an ideological level the division that we rely on between producers and consumers. That is the idea that, you know, according to neoliberalism, we're all producers and we're all consumers, and some of us just happen to be more successful as the sort of entrepreneurial producer-consumer than others. Hence, the, the, the basis for what we used to call class consciousness is eroded. And failing to understand the success of neoliberalism as a comprehensive political, economic, and cultural project, and failing to understand its long-term hegemonic character, means we fail to understand the type of conjuncture that we're in, the true balance of class and political forces, and it means we're always reactively adapting to trends, being wise after the fact, sometimes long after the fact. This is why we've been so ill-placed to respond to the financial meltdown and its various sequels, why we didn't anticipate or understand the reasons why neoliberalism would not merely survive the global recession, but return with a vengeance. It's why it was a shock to see so much passivity in the face of re the recession and the cutbacks in employment, although to be fair, even Mervyn King, governor of the Bank of England, has declared his surprise at the lack of uh, uh, anger over the cuts and so on. It's why it was surprising that so much of the austerity, austerity agenda was either embraced or faced with resigned acceptance by significant sections of the population. It's why it made no sense to us when people seem to accept the idea of shifting the blame from the system, from capitalism, to the poor. And naturally, I mean, you know, I mean, within the neoliberalist purview, I mean, it makes sense that uh, it was the bad entrepreneurs, the people who took risks and failed, um, that had caused the crisis. And it's why when there are uh, precious few signs of struggle, and what struggles do happen seem not to respect the patterns that we're used to, we have no explanation. It's why it was possible to talk of a rank and file strategy in an era with no rank and file, as if the major radical struggles that would take place among a militant kid or a public sector trade unionist in a traditional strike pattern, forgetting that the last great success for our class took the form of the poll tax riots. <laughs> as if we could magic a rank and file into existence. We need a fundamental reappraisal of the neoliberal era and its effects, and we need to be capable of responding by reconstructing from the micro level up forms of solidarity and collectivism, forms of refuge from the savagery of everyday neoliberalism and opportunities for collective action. Okay, so I've, I've got very little time left, so I'm going to um, compress a lot here. Third unpleasant fact that we have to face is the serious diminution of the left's infrastructure over the decades. I don't want to rehearse what you already know, the decline of the Labour left, the decline of a lot of left-wing organisations, the Communist Party of Great Britain, uh, and so on. Um, but it's not just the left, there's a general weathering of popular voluntary organisations, there's a decline of political activity as such, and an increasing privatisation of social life. Now, some people talk about the rise of the social movements, and I agree that that's a very important fact of the last 30 or 40 years, but the striking thing about these movements is that they rarely leave much behind. They rise, there is a moment of euphoria, of expanded possibilities, and then the ruling class, the state, the police, and so on, adapt, change tactics, find ways to shut it down, and there's little to show for it. None of the successes are institutionalized, while the losses leave a psychic residue that wards people off. Now, if your aim is to be a small, mobile, and adaptable group of theoretical and practical leaders, a sort of outsourcing firm for left-wing protest movements, <laughs> which can take up the burden of theorizing and organizing a given mo mo movement, you know, uh, don't you worry about blank, let us worry about blank, uh, <laughs> then that's not necessarily a problem, as long as you brand yourself well, and I must say that parties which talk about panache, flair, and striking while the iron is hot, have done a better <laughs> PR job than those which talk about being an interventionist party. <laughs> then you can, uh, you can corner the market each and every time. Um, but that is, as I hope I'm making clear, a specifically neoliberal division of labor, and it's a model that we have to resist. Um, 
I hope I wasn't being too um, cryptic. <laughs> we need um, an infrastructure which means we need to seek to create a convivial democratic organization or ensemble of organizations with a genuinely mass base. And I really mean mass here. If we're not trying to build mass organizations, then I'm afraid we're wasting our time. Why do we need that? Well, practicalities. We need something that can raise and handle money because more and more of the uh, resources that make left-wing activism possible cost more and more money, like rooms in universities, for example. That's neoliberalism for you. Um, more than that, we need to overcome the privatization of social life to provide a bedrock of collective activity against which neoliberal ideology and practices consistently break. I think we need forms of grassroots popular organization organized around the axes where people become politicized, whether it's education, housing, sexism, Islamophobia, whatever it happens to be, we need left unity in the people's assemblies to be oriented toward that objective. Um, okay, I'll just finish on this, if I may, very briefly. Look, um, the network politics was mentioned earlier, the internet and all the rest of it. I don't know if you read Paul Mason's book, Why It's Kicking Off Everywhere. You definitely should. It's an excellent book. Um, and my speech was going to be about why it isn't kicking off everywhere, and then Turkey happened. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, in his book, he, in he uh, interestingly describes the sharing of information on the internet as mimetic, that is, as analogous to the spread, reproduction, and selection of genes in the biological world. The good ideas survive, the bad ones get winnowed out, purely through the format of individuals associating in an on an autonomous basis through the network. That's the idea. And he says that for many activists, the structure of networked individualism has provided a rough replacement for representative democracy. Now there's a problem here. The meme idea is actually more closely modeled on the metaphysical conception of the market that I mentioned earlier than on any pattern of democracy. Nor does the selection of information in this pattern necessarily mean that the good ideas win because the internet, like every other technology, is articulated on existing hierarchies. And, you know, because its, uh, it's, 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 it's materiality, its structure, tends towards supporting, you know, trending topics and all the rest of it, tends towards supporting short-term buzz. And the rapid and sometimes superficial assimilation of ideas lends itself to well-packaged, well emotionally potent PR winning out. Um, I'll give you the example of Invisible Children, for, you know, in, in terms of the way that spread, um, uh, rather than the good ideas winning. So it's not an infrastructure in and of itself, much less a parallel democracy. And of course we need to finally get to grips with the internet and its implications for practice. And we need to overcome the Philistinism about it and the reflex sort of technophobia, but we should not come to the consolatory notion that technology will make up for all that we've lost. Um, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll shut up there. Thanks very much.